Jesus, we know that you're in control. Yeah. yet to come My days are in your hands Each and every one I know you can handle Any challenge that I face Cause you promised to be there Every step that I take I know that everything is in again, Lord, that you are in control. We know you can handle any challenge that we face. Cause you promised you'd be there every step. too big then my God's not bigger remind your people once again that you're in control we know you can handle any challenge that we face cause you promised you'd be there every step every step we know that everything is here Yeah. 
Just give it to him tonight. Give him every worry. Give him every care tonight. We turn over every fear over to you, Lord, because we know it didn't come from you. So we turn it away, Jesus.
praise the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, son. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I wanted to have this opportunity tonight, everybody, because I know that not only the nation has been through a real tragedy, but of course when the nation goes through something like that, we all go through it, every one of us, and we go through it also as a church. And um, a church is a family, and the best thing that can happen when we go through something like this is to get together as a family and just be together. Amen? I think uh, there's a lot of questions on people's minds about, you know, what in the world's going on. I, I won't be able to provide all the answers for you for sure, but we'll take a stab at some of them. Um, yesterday morning, whenever I got up and I saw what was happening on television, I mean, just it was just an unbelievable sight. It was like a, watching some kind of a sci-fi movie. It was like something you'd see come out of Hollywood, but yet it was actually happening. I think that exceeded what happened in New York, exceeded what a lot of movie producers could even produce on film. So tonight, I wanted to get together just for a little while, and, and uh, we'll talk about the Word of God in the course of the night. We're going to pray some in just a little bit. Um, we're going to let you have an opportunity to ask questions relevant to... Um, what's going on and like I said I'm certainly not an authority on Bible prophecy but I love the subject of Bible prophecy and the reason why I love it is because I love seeing things that lets me know that my Lord's about to come and I do believe he's about to come you know um, to start just we'll just pick a place to start I remember whenever um, we moved here in this church, the week that we moved into Brownsville here at this sanctuary, the Gulf War broke out between Kuwait and Iraq. And um, we dedicated the church on January the 13th of 1991. And when we dedicated the church on that Sunday, I had another guest speaker in here on Monday night as part of a dedicatory week, but by Tuesday night, um, the Gulf War had broke out. And that was the week that um, all of a sudden the stark reality of Bible prophecy began to really dawn on not only the Christian world, but sinners too. And I remember that was the week that, um, that bookstores across the nation, Christian bookstores sold out of prophecy books. And that was when churches filled up across America. You remember that? This one filled up also. The week that we dedicated it, it filled up. And um, people began to get really interested in the things of God. A lot of questions began to surface back then. I know back, even back then I was interviewed by several magazines, secular magazines, and, um, you know, they were asking, what do you think is happening and this kind of thing. So when something like this happens, I think it, it's so uh, tragic and it's startling, but yet it's like a trumpet sound to let us know that something is going on and people really want to know what. I think one of the first questions that comes up is, oh, my God, is this the coming of the Lord? Well, let me, ask, let me, let me answer that by saying this. If it was the coming of the Lord, the plane would have never hit the building. Or as soon as it hit the building, you know, I mean, the coming of the Lord is in a moment twinkling of an eye. You wouldn't be around to ask, is this the coming of the Lord? The rapture is signless and timeless. But I think that what we are seeing is we're seeing a lot of events that's sort of like a train. You have the locomotive and it pulls a lot of boxcars. And uh, I think what we're seeing is 
the locomotive started out some time ago and the boxcars, the trains rocking along down the tracks of prophecy and we're seeing some of these and the longer the train goes, the more vivid and the more realistic the coming of the Lord gets. Um, you know, I've had people ask me the question, Brother Kilpatrick, do you think that what happened in New York has anything to do with Revelation 18 about Babylon? You might want to just open up your Bibles and look at that. You have your Bibles? How many of you brought your Bibles? Good. Good, good. I'm going to go ahead and answer the question before we get into reading the chapter. I want to answer the question by telling you that I don't believe that uh, what's happened in New York is Revelation 18. But in the tribulation, when the tribulation is well underway, matter of fact, toward the latter part of the tribulation, a lot of the signs that we're seeing take place right now that we think is so breathtaking and so tragic will pale in comparison to a lot of things that's going to take place in the tribulation. And I got one question before I even start reading this. I really wonder what would have happened. I really wonder what would happen tonight across America if yesterday morning when people got up and cut on their television sets instead of New York burning, it was the rapture of the church. What would have happened if that would have been the case? If people would have got up across America and cut on their television sets and all of a sudden they saw planes crashing because the pilots that were Christians wasn't there to fly them and there was chaos and catastrophe all over the world, I really wonder what would have happened if people would have tuned in their television sets and had seen that the rapture had taken place you wouldn't be able to get within five miles of this church tonight. There'd be so many people trying to get in here. You, you understand what I'm saying? Because after the fact, there's going to be people so stirred, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't even be able to get near a church. There'd be so many throngs of thousands and thousands of people. And just what's happened in New York has stirred people. It has stirred the church and it's stirred even the sinners. I heard uh, a lady yesterday uh, running down the streets of New York, I heard her saying, Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! What's going on, Jesus? I don't know if you saw that or not, but she was a black lady, and she was just crying out to Jesus. She had soot all over her, man, but she was crying out to the Lord. And sinners are asking questions. One of the correspondents yesterday, uh, a female correspondent, I think it was Judy Woodruff from CNN, she said, I have to trust that the Lord knows all about this and that he has salvation for us. It's amazing to hear correspondents say that. You know what I believe could happen? I believe that because of this and other things that may happen real soon, I believe that a spirit of harvest may break forth in America. I really do. I believe it's possible that a real harvest of souls may start taking place. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I trust that it will. I think that's a real possibility. And um, I trust something like that will result because of what all is happening here. But what I'm going to read to you is in the book of Revelation. And, and uh, probably some of you have already read this. And I'll read the chapter. And as I read the chapter, some of you will look at this and you'll think, well, no, that, that is what's happened up in New York. It, it's really not because what this is talking about here is much more catastrophic. But let me tell you this. I want everybody to look at me for a moment. What I do believe is happening is I do believe that the birth pains has already started for the coming of our Lord. I believe the birth pains has started. And I don't think that what happened yesterday and what is going to happen in the next little while is this right here. Um, I'll say one other thing too. Um, 
what happened yesterday is, is uh, as unbelievable as it was. I mean, we all watched in horror as we saw those jets just plunge and disappear into those buildings in a fireball. What happened was just so unbelievable. It was just, you, you saw it, but yet it's just hard to believe that was actually happening. As, as bad as that was, I personally feel like that yesterday was not the most crucial time. In my own spirit, I feel like that the days and weeks to come are the most crucial. And I'll tell you the reason why. And I'm not trying to put fear in anybody. I'm just, I just want you to just think with me for a moment. And that's why I got us here tonight. And I've got the word out and invited you to come so that we can be here together and talk about it and so that we can pray. But... Um, there's, there's a couple of things that's really on my heart and on my mind. One of the major concerns that I have is when the financial markets open back up. You know, I think that um, one or two things could happen. I think that America may be so angry that we want to do anything that we can to thwart what the... Hot, what the um, terrorists tried to accomplish, there's a possibility that Americans, rather than selling their stocks, may hang on to them and may actually try to invest and overcome what the terrorists tried to do. That's a real possibility. But there's also a possibility by the time the NASDAQ and the Dow opens back up, the New York Stock Exchange opens back up, there's also a real possibility that uh, the thing could head south in a hurry. And uh, that, that could have serious ramifications if something like that happened. Because then it would show the vulnerability in a lot of different ways. And the other thing that has me concerned is uh, I know that uh, there's probably a lot of anger in people's hearts, politicians, and, and all of us concerned. There's some anger there that this, such a thing could happen. But whenever we begin to uh, start pursuing whoever we're going to pursue, even rogue nations that would try to protect these terrorists, that also could go south real quick. <clears throat> and I think that we should learn, <clears throat> by now we should learn that, um, you know, the terrorists are not to be taken for granted. Yeah, I believe something should be done. Yes, I do believe that we should do something that should be severe. I believe that also. But in the process of that, I certainly hope things don't unravel. I, I just really feel in my heart a sense of alarm. Um, pardon me for referring back to last Sunday, but when I preached the message last Sunday just watching, I was in, um, I was in a series on the arm of the flesh and the arm of the Lord. And I heard the Lord say to me last Friday, he said, I want you to interrupt and I want you to talk about my coming because he said birth pains are happening. I heard the Lord say that to me. And I said to the Lord, well, Lord, I've already announced that I'm in a process of a, of a, a series here. And I hate to do something like that because it makes you look like you don't know what you're doing. But the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I want you to interrupt that. And for a while, I want you to talk about my coming. He said, because birth pains have already started. So when I had the message and I came in here Sunday morning, the Spirit of God was moving really strong Sunday morning. And it would have been real easy to just sort of step back a little bit and let God just continue to move. But I really felt a strong urgency in my spirit to talk about the coming of the Lord. And I'm not saying that was prophetic and I'm not saying that, uh, you know, that um, my doing that had anything to do with anything because I don't believe that at all. But um, I really sense real strongly in my heart that the Lord wants his church right now to get their eyes on end time events and be prepared and be ready for what's coming. Because I personally, you know, I personally don't know. I, I'm not an expert by any means. 
and I'm not in the know. I'm just a preacher here in Pensacola, Florida. But in my spirit, it just seems like that this thing is not over. So, um, you know, when you get up and you get on your television, you see a, one of the twin towers on fire. And then you see about 18 minutes later, another plane go right into the other twin tower. You know then it wasn't just an accident. You knew then it was a hostage situation, terrorist situation. And then when you flip over and you see on the other channel that the Pentagon's on fire, it'll shake your world. Because those are the things that makes America what America is. Those twin towers were symbols of what America's all about. And also, uh, the Pentagon is a symbol of our military strength. And believe me, the two things that America has taken pride in down through the years has been our financial strength and our military strength. But you know, I think it's time that America kindly forget about those things and let's start relying on the Lord again. Amen. Amen. I don't think our nation needs to um, rely on politicians, shrewd politicians. I certainly don't think that we need to rely on the military might of this nation or the economic strength of this nation. We have strayed so far from God that I have really been shocked during the process of all this going on. I've really been shocked that I haven't heard the Lord talked about more than I've heard him talked about. And I appreciated last night the president talking about the 23rd Psalm. That was good, but that, that's not good enough as far as I'm concerned. He needs, to, he needs to preach a little bit right now. Amen. And isn't it wonderful to see the Democrats and Republicans working together? Wow. Why can't they do that all the time? It's almost like they've been born again up there. And uh, we are in a national crisis, and, and I don't think that, I really don't think that truly in America, the real, the real gravity of what has happened has still, I don't think it's really still gripped our minds. It still hasn't fully registered what has happened. And you know, friend, if you look on your television and see that canyon up there where the Twin Towers used to be, those things so disintegrated when they came down that one twin tower was only two feet, uh, two stories of rubble, and the other one was about five stories of rubble. Now you're talking about 220 stories, but those things came down with such force and such gravity and such pressure that on the way down they just disintegrated and just powder and dust. It's hard for our minds to comprehend two buildings that tall, the tallest buildings in the world, two buildings that tall being brought down. It's just hard for our minds to comprehend that. But yet it happened. And to, for us to see those firefighters out there by the thousands trying to work and trying to um, rescue as many people as they can, television does not do justice what kind of canyon that really is out there. And then of course I'm sure you saw tonight before you came here, you probably saw that building number five, building number seven collapsed last night. It was a 50-story building. And tonight, another 52-story building is right on the verge of collapse. So you take 110 stories, 110 stories, and 50 stories, and 52 stories, that's over 330-something stories down. And what you also need to understand is most of that, most of that um, real estate housed our financial securities and exchanges and investments and insurance corporations. And uh, that stuff, you saw the papers floating down in the atmosphere as those buildings came down, you saw the papers floating. And so I'm sure they, they, they um, for sure are gonna have to wait a little while before they bring the New York Stock Exchange back up as well as the NASDAQ. And these terrorists knew what they were doing whenever they made a strike because they were actually striking at trying to bring down our economic system here in America. 
and change our lifestyle and change the wealth of this nation. And, um, you know, <clears throat> one of the things I think that we need to pray about tonight whenever it comes time to pray, one of the things I think that we need to pray about is I don't think it's time for people to get on the television and mislead us into believing that things are one way when they're really not that way. I think that we need to be told the truth. And, um, you know, they're saying that the bond markets are fine and this is going to be fine and that's going to be fine and we're going to pick up where we left off. To me, it just seems hard to imagine that that can happen with such devastation. And I pray that it can happen. But uh, I think that we need to pray tonight and believe God that whenever the, the markets come back up, that this nation doesn't go into a panic situation on top of everything else that we've gone through. So in the book of Revelation chapter 18, this is going to happen, and it sounds real familiar. It says, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and earth was lightened with his glory. He cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and all the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, and the cup which she has filled filled to her double. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she said in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no a widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall utterly be burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is her judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys her merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and manner of vessels of ivory and vessels of most precious wood and brass and iron and marble, cinnamon, odors, ointments, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, beast and sheep, horses, chariots, slaves and souls of men. And the fruits of thy soul lusteth after are departed from thee and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by the sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads, and they cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships by the sea, reason of her costliness, in one hour she made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city of Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of the harpers and the musicians and of the pipers and the trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman and whatsoever craft he shall be shall be found any more in thee at all. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were great, men of the earth, and for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. 
and in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and all that were slain upon the earth. That concludes chapter 18, and what that sounds like, and it does call it Babylon, and what that sounds like, it does sound like a great city. It sounds like New York. And the reason why I read this is because some of you may hear about this, or some of you may have already read it, and I know people are talking about, are we in chapter 18 of the book of Revelation? And I believe, I'm not an expert, but I don't believe that what happened in New York is this at all. And I'm not even sure that this would be New York. It sounds like it could be New York, but the devastation is not widespread enough for this chapter to be fulfilled. But what I'm telling you is this. If you remember Sunday morning when I got up here and I was preaching, I was talking about how that um, in 1993, I believe it was, they made an attempt to bring down the uh, World Trade Center. You remember? They bombed it and they made the attempt. Well, that was bad. But now by 2001, they didn't just bring down one tower of the, twin, of the World Trade Center. They brought down both of them. So that's why I was talking about Sunday morning. The Bible says that evil men will wax worse and worse. You understand that? And by me saying that, what I'm saying is they attempted it in 1993 and were not successful. But just 10 years later, they were doubly successful. And uh, that's why the Bible says that evil men will wax worse and worse. And that's why I say to you, every one of us needs to come to grips with this fact that this world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's open door I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And what we see happening is this. We see that evil is going like this and the righteous are going like this. And you remember I talked not long ago about the, um, the scripture about the wheat and the tares. And I told you in that message that there's a bundling going on. The Lord said in the last days he would send his angels and he would separate the wheat from the tares. He said, let them both grow together till the end. He said, I'll send my angel. And the angel came and he knows the difference between the wheat and the tares. Tear looks just like a wheat. With the exception, they can be found out at harvest time because no matter how much it looks like a wheat during the growing season, when the harvest time comes, there's no fruit there. The wheat has grains in it in the top the tear doesn't. And the angel comes in the end of the age and he separates the tares from the wheat. And the Bible says he bundles them, he separates them, one for the fire, the tares for the fire, and the wheat for the barn. And I think what we're really seeing going on is there's such a, such a separation now. It's like for so long, just things rocked along, rocked along, rocked along. But now it's like Wickedness is going like this, and the righteous is going like this. And there's a clear line of demarcation now between those that love God, love His Word, love the moving of His Spirit. They're the bride. They're looking for their bridegroom. There's a big difference in those people and those that really just are religious and don't really care about those things. You remember Sunday morning I told you, in the message, what would happen if the Lord let somebody get to heaven that chews, smokes, or, or dips? You know, it sounded sort of humorous. But to me, it wasn't humorous. What would happen to a person if God would somehow let them into heaven and they had pornography in their life? What would somehow happen if God could somehow let a sinner get into heaven and he was a stealer of money, he was an embezzler? The Bible says in the last days they'll love the darkness more than the light. And people that have those kind of sins in their life, there's a darkness about them. And you may think, well, I'll be ready for the rapture. When Jesus comes, I'll be ready for the rapture. Well, I want to ask you a question. What makes you think that if there's a habit in your life that's sin and you hadn't got rid of that habit, maybe pornography, whatever it may be, what makes you think at the rapture, all of a sudden, God's going to overlook that and let you get on into heaven? You've got to get rid of that while you're down here. 
you got to drop that off down here and get that under the blood down here. All of a sudden, it's not going to trumpet sound, and you're going to go up and all of a sudden be changed, and you're going to be like the righteous saints of God, and you've got all this sin in your life. That's deception. You're deceived into believing you're going to heaven when you may be going to hell. And I think it's time that, that preachers begin to talk to people like that. You may be going to hell, but deceived into believing that you've got these things in your life, and the Lord's going to wink at it. And when the rapture takes place, all, well, you and all those sins are going to go up to heaven, and you're just going to somehow be changed in the rapture, and it'll be all right when you land in heaven. No, that's not the case, friend. If you're not holy now, you won't be holy then. And if you're not ready now, you won't be ready when the rapture takes place. And that's what, got, that's what has me concerned about the church in America today. We have played patty cake so long with congregations. Those of us behind the pulpits have played patty cake so long. And we've danced around the sin issue so long until people have been misled into believing that God's winked at something that's in their life that he's not winking at anymore. And uh, I, I want to just tell you that I feel the sobriety of the hour. And uh, I feel that we're really fast approaching now. You see, friend, this is not 1934. This is not 1971. This is not 1996. This is 2001. And in about 90 days, or 120 days, it's going to be the dawning of 2002. So, in 1991, when the Gulf War broke out, I felt like it was serious then, but I didn't feel the seriousness then that I feel now. I feel a seriousness now that's much more sobering because it seems like the time is right for whatever God is doing and whatever he's allowing to happen, the time is right. And I just think that there needs to be some sober voices come from the churches of America right now and really bring a sobriety to the body of Christ. You see, what they're doing in New York, and I guess it's okay. I guess there's a positive about it and a negative. What they're trying to do right now in New York, the politicians going up there and the mayor and all of them, and I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to bring confidence to people and hope to people. And they're saying, we're Americans and we'll rebuild. And they won't do this to us and we're going to be fine. And we're going we're, we're to release all this money in Congress and we're going to do this and we're going to rebuild and we're going to fix the Pentagon. And we're going to be like we was before. Well, that's an American spirit and that's fine. But what about God's spirit that's dealing with us today? What about God's spirit? That's the issue. And there is going to come a day that that American spirit is not going to prevail where we're going to say, well, you can't do this to us. Well, I think somebody did something to us yesterday that's despicable. And it's tragic. And I don't think we need to be 24 hours later making light of it like, well, we're going to rebound better than ever. I think there's some serious days ahead and I certainly hate to see America just shirk this off right now and act like everything's going to be okay. And these are sober days. And you know what? I pray that America will rebound and I pray that it will be fine. I really do. I pray that. I'm American. I, I want to do as good as anybody else, sure. But I do believe that these next days and weeks to come are going to be some real sober times that we need to be... Uh, need to walk very carefully before God. Hallelujah. Okay. We'll take a few questions, Brother Bill. If you have a question you'd like to ask, um, just lift up your hand and we have people in the audience with microphones. That's going to, uh, if you'll just lift up your hand. Your left, Pastor. Your left, Pastor. Okay. Okay, Pastor, I just want to, I've got a, a question here. Uh, just how, how do you think that this, uh, first of all, do you think that this is, this is a, a judgment? And secondly, uh, how do you compare what you just said with uh, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, and Isaiah 26, 9 and 11? Well, 11. I don't have it before me. What does it say? Okay. 
Uh, well, in, in Proverbs 21, it says uh, the kings are in the hands of the Lord as rivers of water. He turns them wherever he wants. In uh, Isaiah 26, 9 through 11, it says, When judgments are in the land, will the, will the wicked learn righteousness? But if you show grace unto the wicked, they will not learn righteousness. Yeah. I guess my question is, as I see it, it looks like this is some judgment on America. It's a, it's a sober awakening day for us to take notice. Although I, maybe this not be called the city of Babylon, yeah. but it's a type. The World Trade Center is a type, so. Well, you know, I have to be honest with you and tell you, you know, if you ask me my personal opinion, I'll tell you my personal opinion. I do believe it's judgment. I really do. I believe that everything that happens is Father filtered. Everything is Father filtered. Now, if that airplane yesterday that crashed in Virginia was headed for the White House, and that thing crashed in Pittsburgh. Only God knows why that plane crashed, but evidently, the, if it was headed for the White House, the Lord wouldn't let it get to the White House. And I'll tell you this right now, I believe that God has given us a man of God in the White House. And I believe George W. Bush. There it is. I believe that George W. Bush is, is a Christian. I believe he's got a good spirit. He may not be your type Christian or as spiritual as you'd like him to be, but I have a lot of confidence in the man. I believe he's principled, and I believe his family is a, is a wonderful family. And um, I believe the Lord's going to protect the president. I don't believe he's going to let nothing happen to our president. But I have to be honest with you and tell you this, that in the previous administration, whenever that situation was handled like it was over Monica Lewinsky, and people said, we don't care what he's done, the economy's good. To me, that was a foreboding. It was a foreboding. And I, I told the church, you know, one of the things, I've had people tell me before, they said, Brother Kilpatrick, if you'd just be a little bit more diplomatic, you could go places. <laughs> but the question is, where do I want to go? You know, I don't, I don't really care to go anywhere. And, uh, you know, I just don't, I, I'm just the type of person that if something's wrong, I'm not going to pull back and tell you it's another way whenever I feel like it's one way. And whenever our previous administration was in control and people kept saying, it's the economy stupid and we don't care what he's done, the economy's good. To me, it was like a foreboding that somehow that economy's going to have to be fooled with. And... Uh, I do, you know, I do in my heart believe that it's the judgment of the Lord. I believe that God's got our president in place. I believe he's going to use him. I believe he's going to use him much more greater than even politically. I believe the man that they lampooned and made fun of and said he was dyslexic and made all kind of jokes about him, I believe that God's going to raise him up and really use him to bring a lot of um, leadership in this nation and people's going to be astounded. I believe that. And um, did that answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, appreciate so much uh, talking about these kind of things. This is exciting to me. We live in exciting times. Um, I'm out a couple weeks. Uh, sometimes three weeks every month. I don't know if I'm preaching in the same churches that, that you, you preach in, uh, but I, I'm just going to be real honest in saying that uh, there's an incredible apathy uh, that's in the church today. And you talked about the separating the wheat and the chaff. We look at, sometimes we look at the church world, we look at the secular world, but I see so much of the secular world influencing the church world, yeah. and it's tragic. And... Uh, I look at the competition that I am in as an evangelist, as a man of God, trying to get people to come to our meetings and so forth. And pastors are very honest and, and forthright about the fact they have trouble getting people coming to a revival or to an extended meeting. But uh, you were quoting from 2 Timothy Sunday and talking about the, the last days and what it was going to be like, men being lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And you mentioned tonight in regard to the economy, and I don't want to, uh, I wouldn't want to add to anyone's fears, but I... 
I have mixed feelings about what's going to happen in the days to come with the economy and, and, and what, how I feel as, as someone who wants to see people turn toward God about that. Uh, if, there's an, if there's idolatry in this nation, if there is something, if there's something that's got to fall for God to break out, it's got to be the dollar. It's got to be money. It's got to, something's going to have to change in the, in the course of this nation to make people hungry for God and recognize their need for God. And unless the dollar falls, unless the economy implodes in some way, and I, and I believe the Lord's going to take care of the righteous. I believe church is going to be all right through any of it. So I'm not walking in fear as one who trusts God every, every week for, to, to make our bills. But I, I want, uh, my cry, my heart's cry is if, if the nation has to implode, if the financial markets have to fall in order for God to break out, and we've had repentance, but in, you know, if you go through history, whether it be Samuel asking for the Israelites to come back or Hezekiah, they had to bring down the idols. We, have, we serve a God that's a jealous lover. If we don't have the idols come down, uh, the sports and, and all the rest and all the things our world worships that have crept its way into the church, if those things don't fall, then how can we see people turn to God? And I just want to throw this out to you that... that uh, my heart's cry is if, if Wall Street has to take a fall, so be it. Let the people of God recognize they need God and God alone. I just want to know what your feeling is about the economy. And, and if it would, would fall, do you feel, don't you feel that that would, would help bring about a prompting of people to turn toward God? You know, I thought about that. <clears throat> Look at, um, let me see if I can find it. Turn to the book of Revelation. I'm having to look for something here. Let me see if I can find it. Teresa, where are you at, baby? Teresa, where's she at? Uh, bring the microphone to her and let her tell real quick, Bill, about um, uh, how the Lord's been dealing with her lately. I have a lot of confidence in Teresa. She's one of our intercessors. And uh, she told me this Saturday was a week ago, and so I, I remembered it when all this happened. I, I just thought you might be interested in hearing this. I'm gonna look for something while she's telling you that. Um, about a month and a half ago, I was jolted out of sleep about four o'clock in the morning. Usually I would wake up very easily and I go to sleep very easily. But I was jolted out of sleep and before I woke up, the image that I had in a dream was an, a pregnant abdomen with the muscles constricting and pulling and turning. And as I was jolted out of sleep, I mean I was trembling on the inside and I heard the Spirit of the Lord say, birth pangs birth pangs and I got up and I went to the uh, living room and I opened my Bible and he led me to Matthew 24 and as I was reading Matthew 24 about the eighth verse or so I heard the Spirit of the Lord say the beginning of sorrows this is the beginning of sorrows and I remember saying to the Lord Lord is it now do you mean now right now Lord and he said now it's the beginning of sorrows and all this week that I've been hearing, um, and a lot of the intercessors, and we've been talking out at the school of how animals seem to sense when something's going on. And when we went on the internet, when Pastor preached on Sunday, the week before that, we were talking about how the animals just seem to be going nuts. Uh, the, the sharks, the mosquitoes uh, carrying uh, dangerous um, uh, illnesses and we heard about a boa constrictor that had killed a little eight-year-old girl uh, up north somewhere, and a pit bull had mauled um, a nun, and um, just one thing after another, and the whales running into the ships and everything. And we just sensed for a couple of weeks that, what, what is it, Lord? You just, you know how you feel when your insides feel like jelly, and you don't really know what it is, but that's what I, I heard, and I've been hearing it and hearing it. These are the beginning of sorrows. In response to your question there, um, you might want to turn to Revelation 16. I'll show you something here. <clears throat> Revelation 16. 
You know, one of the things that really bothers me, go ahead and find Revelation 16 right quick if you want to. Look this way when you found it. One of the things that really bothers me as a preacher is people when they're, when they're wrong, how they just can't humble themselves and repent. That, that bothers me. And I mean, I see it in the church and I also see it in the world. What scares me is when you see it in the church and people are wrong and they have the wrong spirit and they're doing wrong things and they so defend their wrong that they will not humble themselves and repent. That bothers me. It makes me afraid for them. Um, just like, for example, President Clinton, and I say this respectfully, I don't say it in a condemning way, I say it respectfully. Whenever the Supreme Court put him in a corner about Monica Lewinsky, he had said, I, I did not have sex with that woman, this, that, and the other. Finally, whenever they, the, the evidence was there, he had to come out with it. But even then, he had a hard, hard, hard time showing repentance. And Gary Condit, you know, uh, I mean, here's a man caught in a relationship with this young girl. And whenever he's confronted with these questions by Connie Chung and others, he'll talk about how he's been married 32 years to his wife. And he, he, it's just a political, political spin. And dancing around the issue. What happened to the days when people were confronted with their sin and they just bowed down before God and put sackcloth and ashes on and said, my God, have mercy on me, I have sinned. What, what's happened to those days? You know, what has happened that people are losing the ability to repent? In Revelation 16, it said, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the veils of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his veil upon the earth, uh, his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men that had the mark of the beast and upon them that worshiped his image. And then it talks about different things that was happening. And then it says the fourth angel poured his out in verse 8. And in verse 9 it says men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which had power over those plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And it just goes right on down, talking about how that men repented not of their deeds. You know why I believe that we're close to the coming of the Lord? Is because already people are having a hard, hard time repenting of their deeds. This is the tribulation here. This passage of scripture is tribulation scripture. But I know we've been in revival here in Brownsville for years and we've seen some repentance. But out there, it's like he just asked the question a while ago, if God has to touch the economy to bring people to repentance, do you think God's gonna do that? I have to be honest with you and answer it like this. I'm not sure if the economy collapsed, if people wouldn't blaspheme God and refuse to repent. I'm not sure about that. It's just like God asked Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? No, Ezekiel had to say, God, <laughs> hey, only you know. And I have to say, in a situation like this, if the, if the stock market crashed or if there's more terrorism or whatever, will it bring America to its knees to repent? I don't know. I don't know. And that's, that's the part that's scary to me. I've seen some things happen in the church that has absolutely set me back on my heels, man. Just set me back on my heels, unbelievable. And no spirit of repentance. And it's just like Jesus. Another question. Okay, sound good. Uh, Pastor, uh, we all believe that the rapture is right here. And uh, I believe we, we believe 
when the rapture comes during the tribulation will start. That'll be the time of Jacob's trouble when God will be dealing directly with Israel. And as of this day, anytime Israel has a problem or gets into trouble, the United States is always their ally, comes in their helper. But when God deals with Israel, one on one, time of Jacob's trouble, the United States is not going to be able to. Does that mean that we could possibly be the rapture of the church will be gone and the United States will fall? Or does it mean that we'll probably fall possibly before? Or yeah, I wondered about that too, Sonny. Um, you know, I know in the tribulation, nobody's going to be able to come to Israel's defense. Uh, America right now is the might of the world. And America is going through what we're going through because we are the defender of Israel. If we weren't the defender of Israel, that wouldn't have happened yesterday. And um, so I think that the scenario probably will be, hopefully, that the Lord will come and America will be emptied of so many believers and Christians that America won't be the same power somehow. Um, another thing that you have to take in consideration, when the rapture takes place, the Holy Spirit is still going to be here, but he won't be here like he is now. You understand? Right now, the Holy Spirit works and moves in the body of Christ. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. When we're caught up, he goes up with us, of course, but he's still going to be here to oversee God's prophetic plan. But Christians in the tribulation won't have the same kind of power that we have now before the tribulation. See, he gave us power to tread upon scorpions and serpents and all that. Well, during the tribulation when the church is caught out of here and the scorpions come up from hell that has the power to sting men and they won't be able to die, Christians won't have the power then to rebuke those scorpions and to tread on those scorpions. It won't be the same kind of power then that Christians have now before the rapture. So what, what I'm saying is I, I don't know if America is going to be depleted before the tribulation and won't be able to help Israel? I certainly hope not. That would be scary. I would prefer to believe that after the rapture takes place, America won't be the same nation as it is now. That's what I would prefer to believe. But hey, you never know. I think, you know, sometime too, um, church, what happens when people get involved in Bible prophecy like this, they get real adamant on things. I don't think it's really good to get adamant on anything except what you know you can prove from the Word of God, you know? But areas where there's questions and you can't really nail it down and really prove so-and-so, so-and-so, I think I'd just leave that to the Lord and let Him fulfill it however He wants to. But uh, I do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, and I, I believe the Lord's going to come before the rapture. Yeah? Uh, Pastor, um, Genesis 11 talks about Tower of Babel, and I wonder since it was on the 11th, if you see any correlation, and it says, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built, and he didn't kill anyone then, but now if his anger has waxed that hot, shouldn't we really be concerned? Yeah, what was that about the 11 then? It was Genesis chapter 11, yeah. the, the story of the Tower of Babel. Yeah, so your question is what? I wonder if that isn't a, a confirmation that it is God's judgment. And if his anger is waxed that hot, shouldn't we really be very concerned and be stronger witnesses and just just go all out to, yeah. to tell everybody about Jesus? Yeah. Um, well, that, inter that 11 is an interesting number because um, um, the Count David Accord, when Jimmy Carter was president, the Count David Accord was forged in September. And it went from, I think, the 9th through about the 16th or 17th of September. So on the very week that that was to be commemorated, the Camp David Accord, whenever Jimmy Carter and Begin and Sadat signed the Camp David Accord, this bombing took place in New York. And uh, I think that that was, you know, somehow maybe significant to the, to the uh, terrorists that did what they did, I'm not sure. 
Um, I can't say that I really understand your question, though, about the Tower of Babel. Can you help me to understand that just a little bit better? I guess I'm asking, do you see a correlation in that when he destroyed the Tower of Babel, he just did it. He didn't kill anyone. Oh, he yeah. just confused them. Yeah. But now, is he really that much more angry to show us his anger and his judgment because it says it's coming with fire? that shouldn't we really be really really on our faces a lot more and and be pray for more boldness to just witness to everybody where they want to don't wait for the open door i think if if what is happening and i'm not saying that it is you know i want everybody to understand that, that i'm not saying that it is but i think if what's happening is a sign um and a deterioration that we can look in the Bible and see that things are deteriorating and getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Um, I would say that uh, things will probably get worse if that happens, and you'll you'll for sure know the anger of the Lord. You you'll be able to see it, and the nation will be able to see it. And in a way, there's there's a part of me that hopes that will happen, to bring people to repentance. But yet, there's another part of me that says, Oh God, if that happens, I I don't know if they'll repent or not. You know. But I would hope that they would. I, I do believe this. I believe that revival broke out in Brownsville in 1995. It broke out in Toronto, it broke out in Argentina, and different places over the world. And when, before revival broke out, here's what the Lord told me. The Lord said to me, he said, I'm going to send revival. It's going to be mighty. And he said, I'm going to honor the prayers of my people and I'm going to send revival. And he said, I'm going to give a space to repent. And I believe that the revivals that's taken place over the world and the nations of the world, the Brownsville Revival alone, including other revivals, but the Brownsville Revival alone touched the world and touched many churches. And they got back on fire for God and came out of their backs lit in cold, lukewarm condition. But now, you know, I believe that God's given us a space to repent. And boy, I tell you, I think it's time for people to repent. It's not time to roll over and, and take the switcher on your TV and just flick and, and satisfy the lust of getting, you know, being a news hog. It's not time to do that. It's time to see these things on television, cut the TV off and go to prayer and say, oh, my God. It's time, it's time for the church to pray right now. But I think that, you know, I think even in the worst of times that God can still work in the worst of times. And I trust that, uh, you know, repentance will come about because of this. She's right. Uh, Pastor, I um, realized that uh, several years ago, David Wilkerson began um, preaching that there was going to be a Great Depression, and I assume that, that you're aware, aware yeah. of that. And when you were, um, I didn't even, didn't even think about it. Uh, I haven't been receiving his, his material for some time, but... Um, when you mentioned that you, you felt in your spirit that, you know, you couldn't see things just evening out again and people talking about the economy, other people talking about the economy. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts might be on that. I believe, I believe David Wilkerson is a mighty man of God. And um, I believe that he is prophetic. And uh, I was just reading a prophecy before we came in tonight from a preacher that I had in my home. Uh, he's a powerful preacher from Romania and I had him years ago and I was just rereading his prophecy that somebody brought me tonight before the service and I, I have thought about David Wilkerson since yesterday and uh, you know a lot of people call him a prophet of gloom and doom but yet when something like this happens they start ringing him up you know and um, so I thought about him a lot and um, you know in good times, whenever the stock market is soaring and everybody's doing good financially, nobody wants to hear that kind of talk. But all of a sudden, something like this happens. They want to search out the man that wrote some of that stuff and say, what's going on? What's going to happen? But I think that, you know, when God puts pressure on somebody, if they, if they repent just to get some wiggle room, to get out from under the pressure of, of God, and they're trying to convince God they're going to do a certain way while he's got them under pressure, and then they get out under that pressure and they don't do what he, they told him he would do. I think that's probably a lot of about 
the way God sees things in America, he puts pressure on us and we start to squalling and bawling and crying and repenting. But then when the pressure's off, we go right back to our sin. And I think God's tired of that. He says, like I said, when we dedicated this building that week, this church filled up and churches filled up across the nation. But within a month's time, when the Gulf War was over, we was all back down to just like we were before. And uh, that's a little scary. And so I think God's trying to bring about something in, in us that we're, you know, it's going to be something that'll last, a true repentance. Well, okay. I have a question. You know, after this whole thing, everyone's like, you know, we got to find people that did this. And especially our president, everyone's just like, whoever did this is going to really pay because they killed yeah. thousands of people. And we're all just like, they need to get paid for. And what I was thinking about is Romans chapter 12, verse 19, the Lord says, don't worry about revenge because God's wrath will take place or whatever. And revenge is mine, says the Lord. Should we really like, take that and affect what it is? Because, I mean, should we just trust God that, okay, you can deal with the people over there? I think if you're talking to the church, that's an effect. But I think if you're talking to Congress, that's not an effect. <laughs> um, you know, I think in the body of Christ, you, judgment and revenge is the Lord's. You leave that to him. You have to. But whenever you're talking about a legal system like the judicial government of America, it's not quite the way it works, you know. They're, they're anxious right now. They're trigger happy. They want to go after somebody. But I appreciate them using prudence and waiting and, and finding the right people to go after. Okay. Pastor, when you speak about revival touching the world, I think of places like Turkey and Pakistan and... Yep all those stand countries over there where right. the doors are closed. Right. What do you think it's going to take for God's spirit to be poured out on all man and to get into those countries and affect those countries where we'll see that? Well, you know, right now the Taliban is trying Christians for witness and trying to convert people to Christianity and they're putting them on trial, you know. It'll take the Holy Ghost to invade societies like that because they're such a closed society. Christians can't get in there. But from what I hear, I hear reports where God has invaded some of these Muslim Islamic countries. And um, there's even people seeing visions of Jesus and the Lord's appearing to them in their dreams and talking to them about the gospel and how they need to repent and turn to him. And I'm, I'm hearing that there is some limited revival moving in some of those countries like that. So. I don't know. I don't know how that'll all pan out, but um, I think what I think what the Brownsville revival has done basically is it has it has stirred the church again, the church in all parts of the world. Now, there's been a lot of people come to the Lord that never has been saved. That's true, but I think countries that has had where there's been an open door for the gospel and they just sort of got cold and lax and lukewarm. I believe that Brownsville revival, among others, has helped stir them back to a passion for Jesus and coming of the Lord and the lost. By the sound booth. Okay. Um, my question was, um, do you think that God is like putting us through a test to see if we really do have faith in him, that we are, that we are protected and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us? Hmm. You know, sweetheart, I, I, the good news about this is that no matter what happens, we're all in the hands of the Lord. All of us are in the hands of the Lord. We don't have anything to worry about. The Lord's going to take care of us. Um, I know it's a scripture that you might not be familiar with, but the Bible says that he has not appointed us to wrath, Christians to wrath. And that's why he's watching out for our interests. God is going to deal with things in his way, but he's always going to make sure that his family, his children are taken care of. So you don't need to be concerned about that. He's going to take care of us. I'm not concerned about it at all. Uh, Pastor, it's been many years ago, but I heard it said that you cannot find the United States in Bible prophecy. Uh, is that true? I think that's debatable. You know, there's people that say that you can. There's people that say that you can't. I think you can find symbols 
of certain nations in the scripture, you know, like the Russian bear. And, and uh, you go back over into Daniel and you begin to see the leopard and all those different nations. They're represented, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Babylonian Empire. They're represented by different animals. But America is only 200 something years old. And I think that there may be scriptures in the, in the Bible that points to, uh, you know, the young whelps that comes up later. I think that may be considered America. But uh, as far as any particular symbol or any particular thing that you just look in the Bible and say, now there's America, I don't know if you can do that or not. But, um, you know, I, I think that there's some scriptures in Jeremiah that, that I have always looked at that's led me to believe that it probably was America. But I think, you know, you just can't, you just can't say it adamantly. Pastor, I want to just thank you for uh, making this time available to shepherd us in, in difficult times. And I so much appreciate you um, specifically shepherding us to not get so involved in the news enough to know what's happening, but then to turn it off quickly and turn to the Lord yep. in prayer. Um, God has been putting Nehemiah 9 on my heart for about a week now. And um, the essence of it is one whereby there's been uh, destruction and lack of repentance and the remembrance of when we repented, you heard our sins and you came in our distress. And it goes, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine examples of remembering. But ultimately, in uh, Nehemiah 9, towards the end, um, verses 35 to 38, um, he talks about the kings and leaders and the priests that, that have not kept your law, God. And he says, um, they in their own kingdom, with your great goodness, which you gave them, with the broad and rich land, which you set before them, did not serve you or turn from their evil deeds. Behold, we are slaves today and as to the land which you gave to our fathers to eat of its fruit and its bounty, behold, we are slaves in it. Its abundant produce is for the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. And they also rule over our bodies and over our cattle as they please, so we are in great distress. Now, because of all this, we're making an agreement in writing, and we'll seal this document. And then it goes on, the people respond with a covenant relationship to God. And I wonder if you might um, address some of the ways that are more subtle than the, the sins that, um, you know, pornography you mentioned. I mean, these, these sins, I think God is calling us as a people to sanctify the sin in our life. And I wonder, Pastor, if you might shepherd the people in um, ways that we might really take extreme measures in this time in covenant response to our Lord. I think that um, just a general sense of apathy has crept in, you know, to, to the church, like the brother was saying a while ago, there's just a real sense of apathy where, you know, personally what I feel like happened, I think that Christians got so worked up about the coming of the Lord that when the year 2000 came, I think a lot of Christians felt like Jesus was going to come by the year 2000. And when he didn't come, they let their guard down. They got discouraged. And then when he didn't come in 2001, they really got discouraged. And they just sort of slipped back into apathy. And that's one of the traps of date setting and, and getting something so fixated in your mind that God's going to do this by this time. God does what God wants to do when God wants to do it. And, um, you know, I think that whenever any of us gets to a place that God doesn't do for us what we thought he ought to do when we thought he ought to do it, apathy sets in, and we sort of get hurt with him. And uh, I think that it takes things like this as a wake-up call to let people really realize we better stay alert. So, yeah, there's some bad sins that God's people have been involved in, but I think one of the greatest sins is, is, is apathy. And that's what we need to repent of probably more than anything. Yeah, right here. Okay. Pastor, I was just, uh, I was watching tonight the, the House Representatives and they were talking about 
the revenge they were going to take and the actions they were going to take. And um, I was just wondering what kind of position we're in concerning spiritually with the Lord without having a repentant country going out and actually trying to fight a battle proclaiming we have God. That's why I'm comfortable with George Bush being in the office. I'm comfortable with him. I think if we had a real degenerate man there or woman at the helm of the country, I think they could really, you know, make some big boo-boos. But I, I think that George Bush will pray before he does anything. I know his dad did. I know his dad prayed before he went into the Gulf War. And so, you know, when the elections were so tied up down here in Florida, you know, I believe that God had his will. It was Father Filter. God had his will done to put George W. Bush in office. God knows what's coming. And he'll have the right man at the right place at the right time. Always has and always will. Pastor, to your right. Okay. Um, I heard today uh, about the ramifications this might have on what's going on in Israel. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you had anything to share on that. Um, they had said that uh, because of this, this might affect how Israel will be able um, to give its support because that would affect what's happening over there for them. Yeah. And that uh, then that would have an effect on how President Bush will or will not have a desire to get more involved in what's going on over there. Yeah. And um, that was my question. I think, I think that there's such an adamancy right now. I think President Bush is so adamant and so is, is um, Ariel Sharon. Ariel Sharon on television yesterday declared today, Wednesday, in, in Israel to be um, a day of mourning, something like that, for America. So I don't think he really cares what anybody thinks. I don't think he cares if they think that they're mourning for America. And President Bush has made it clear, uh, before President Bush was elected, I had the opportunity to talk to him on the telephone. I was invited with uh, 12 other preachers across Florida to um, be on a conference call with him before he was elected. He was just a nominee. And we preachers got to chat with him on the telephone. We got to ask him any question we wanted to ask. And I got to ask the last question. And I said, um, Mr. Bush, I said, if you're elected president, I said, uh, what's your stance on Israel? And he said, my stance on Israel is when everybody else walks away and leaves it, I'll still be there with her. So he had my vote right there. And he said, when everybody else walks away, I'll be there with Israel. And so I, I don't think that that's going to have that much bearing on it. Yeah. Pastor, what I had to say is more of an observation uh, than a question. Uh, I know that everything that happens in the physical world, it starts in the spiritual world. Yeah. And just as you preach and you teach and it builds faith, and we believe God and our faith brings about the things that we prayed for. I also noticed that uh, things that are said by a lot of the commentators about the intelligence, uh, some of the comments they made, they said that their greatest fears have come to pass. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering right now how much that has uh, played into what's happened because they proclaim that these fears of what might happen has come to pass, and I'm wondering in the spiritual world that that would have a big part to play in. I was wondering what your response would be to that. Um, you know, I think uh, <clears throat> there's a bulima will of God, there's a thulima will of God, and the bulima will of God has to do with man, and man can have a hand in it to bring it about, but the thulima of God is... Um, is a theocratic will of God that's going to take place with or without man. And it's just like in the scriptures, this book, every jot and tittle of it, had come to pass whether I'm a living or whether I'm dead. Every jot and tittle had come to pass whether I, whether I fight it or whether I'm against it or, or whether I'm for it. That's the thulling of the will of God. So there's some things that, yeah, you know, your great fears may come to pass, but the Bible plainly says, that uh, there will be dangerous times. Know this, that in the last days, dangerous times will come. So I think that in the hearts of, of unbelievers, there is a fear there 
that they know that the Bible says men's hearts will fail them for fear when they see these things coming upon the earth. I think when people are without Jesus, they know that things are going to come on the earth and they just really see bad things coming and it will cause their heart to fail. But for the Christian, my heart doesn't fail. My heart speeds up saying, oh, Jesus, you're about to come. I get excited. It doesn't strike me down with a heart attack. So, you know, that, that's what I feel about that. I, I, I don't think that their fearing it is going to make it come to pass. I think it's just the will of God. Pastor, to your left. Um, a few months ago when um, Mr. Bush had brought the woman from Israel, or she wasn't from Israel, she was a Jewish woman, and she spoke to us um, one Sunday evening, and she was saying that um, a lot of prophets, um, you know, uh, men of character and trustworthy, had, you know, prophesied and felt that something was going to happen. And also she um, really brought forth the fact that there needed to be um, repentance, not just for herself, but for everything in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I got a call today from Right to Life, and I know um, President Bush, you know, voted against the partial birth abortion. But in the next two to three weeks, um, there's going to be a bill they're trying to put through where there would be human cloning and these clones would be used for experimentation and then put to death. I just wanted to share that. Yeah. Uh, I've been real concerned about that, about the cloning part. You know, the, here's what the Bible says. The Bible, she's talking about Tower of Babel there a while ago. Um, the Bible says that whatever man has imagined, you know, whatever man had imagined in his evil heart, he would be able to bring it about. Once America and once the mindset of America and the medical world and science gets to the point that they feel like they're godlike and they can reproduce life and they can clone humans, whoo, that bothers me real bad. So that's why I say there's so many little telltale signs. There's so many signs that leads us to believe that God's not going to let things go on much longer. Amen? Let's take a few more. I'm going to take just a couple more, several more, and then we're going to pray here in a little bit. Just everybody stay with me. To your right. Okay. Hi. Um, Aren't you the one that said to me? I, I was morning? about to say that. You're not crazy. Sit down, son. Okay. No, I'm kidding. I, I got confused. I didn't know if I was supposed to raise my hand. Or the, okay. Go ahead. I'm just um, kidding. I'm sorry. Gee, wait. Oh, okay. Uh, I was wondering, because um, there's a lot of catastrophes right now. There's a lot of weird things like that cloning and just yeah. all this stuff. What makes this uh, event uh, different that we should look in the scriptures? Or do you think we should even look at the scriptures? Or is this just another disaster kind of thing? Uh, well, no, because this is the greatest catastrophe that's ever happened on our, in our soil. This is not like bringing down an airliner, or this is not like, um, you know, even assassinating a president. Um, they said yesterday, and, and maybe if I'm wrong, you can correct me, but they said that when those buildings are full, when the World Trade Center is full, both towers, that there could be up to 70,000 people in there not only the occupants that has offices there, but, but visitors visiting the tower and all kind of things. They said they can have up to 150,000 people a day visiting the towers. I don't think there was that many people in there. I think they're looking now at, you know, thousands, maybe the low thousands. Who knows how many is in there? They may never know how many is in there. Um, but when something of that magnitude happens that gets the attention of the whole world, that's not just a little headline, that's a big headline. And that shouts to the world and it strikes people in their heart and they begin to immediately begin to think, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? Well, we as, we as Christians, we go to the Word and we say, yeah, that's a sign, that's a major sign. So I think just the, just the magnitude of it lets us know that. To your right, Pastor. Pastor, I'd like to just ask you to respond to this. It's my conviction that the darkness that's come upon 
our nation and the world is the darkness that Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 60, when the darkness will come, but the glory of the Lord will rise upon the church. Yeah. And that the shaking that has happened will shake loose, as it says in Hebrews 12, uh, everything that's not founded on the kingdom of God, so that that which is of the kingdom will last, and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, as it says in Revelation 11:15. And that Brownsville has been like a token of what God wants to do in America. And that this shaking could very well be what will bring America to her knees. And if, if, if we could pray that George Bush would call the nation to repentance like Lincoln did, mm -hmm. call them to rise up and call the nation to repent for turning against God and call America back to God. And that the very revival, the glory, the presence, the manifestation of, of his presence that we've experienced here at Brownsville could be like a token of what he wants to do throughout all of America. And this is the way I see it. BRSM with these young students are the harvesters that God wants to send out into the harvest now that, that will be riper than ever because people will be so broken. America is broken tonight. Mm -hmm. But this is the very thing that could cause revival to spread through well, the nation. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. But here's what, here's what has me concerned today. I, I wasn't this concerned yesterday. But when I hear politicians get on there and they travel up to New York, and then they start this business of, we're going to rebuild. We're going to be greater than ever. Well, that's not repentance. That's arrogance. So what, what, just, just please understand what I'm going to say. That's what makes me wonder if there's not more to come. That was tragic yesterday. But if we think all of a sudden in 24 hours we're recovering and we'll get this garbage up and get it dumped out in the, in the dump and we'll dump all these 300 stories of steel and concrete and bless God we'll build again. If that's our attitude, there may be more to come. That's what has me concerned. Now, I don't think it's time for Senator Schumer and um, Hillary Clinton to go up to New York and, and have that kind of an attitude. I think there needs to be a sob sobriety and a spirit of contrition and an humbling before God because there sure may be more to come. I'm not a prophet, but, you know, there may be more to come. Uh, you know, there may be more to come. Pastor, to your left. Now that the rubber is, has met the road, do you have any advice on how we should prepare in the days ahead, like in practical ways, if you have any advice on that? Um, I think the true Christians are going to be true Christians. You know, if somebody wants to put on an act and act a certain way when, when we're in bad times, if you're putting on an act when bad times are over, you're going to go back to your old original self. So I, what I would say is I think it's time for God's people to really get dead serious and to really humble themselves. Get the sin out. Get the unforgiveness out. Get the habits out and begin to walk circumspect before God because I'm telling you, I believe personally that the Lord's coming is absolutely breathtakingly close. To your right. I um, was struck when they said on CNN and all the different newscasts last night how quiet New York was, that New yeah. York was always a very noisy place and that even the taxi cab drivers stopped beeping their horns and the people were quiet. And for me, in my place of work yesterday, that was the word um, silence was used many times um, as the descriptive on television, and it was very quiet. And even uh, some of the clients trying to get to our place of business, they said they couldn't even get through downtown Pensacola, that like people just stopped driving right. in, during the morning. And I, I've um, remember the scripture in Revelations 8 where it talked about that there was silence for half an hour in heaven and I've never even do you have a comment about that is 
There's been a lot of <laughs> there's been a lot of sermons preached about the silence in heaven, and I don't know if any of them was valid or not. <laughs> you know? I don't think anybody knows what the silence in heaven's all about. I think yesterday people were so shocked that they just wanted to leave the roads and leave the cars and their jobs and go sit under television and watch what was happening and unfolding. Because I think deep down in everybody's heart yesterday, they, they wondered what else is to come. And they were wondering, you know, is the president okay? And, it, and are they going to bomb the White House? And, it, and I think that we were just so taken back and so shocked that people was... Um, vacating the streets to, to watch the tube. Um, but today, like I said, what really concerns me is that silence is breaking now, and now that arrogant American spirit, that troubles me. That troubles me real bad. I think we ought to be positive, and I think that we ought to have a can-do spirit, but there's a big difference in the American spirit and numbling down in a contrite spirit before God. So that, that does bother me. And I know that they're, they're doing this because they think, you know, the nation needs to hear from their leaders and all that. I understand that. I understand that as good as anybody. But I also think somebody needs to come to the forefront that America will listen to and say, you know, we're going to have to depend on the Lord here to help us. God, God's trying to bring America to the point that we look back to God again and not to man. That's why I'm not so sure there's not more to come. Pastor, there's been a, uh, something of my concern about our freedoms being taken away. Because of the breach of security that's happened, there, there's been a lot of speculation on the news about different things being imposed upon us in order to prevent something like this from happening here or even all around the world. And a lot of people who are in higher places are agreeing with that and saying, well, yeah, we do need to give up some of our freedoms in order that the CIA can do what they want, the FBI can do what they want. And, and that's the thing that troubles me most. But, uh, you know, we're the America, the home of the free and the brave. And, and you know, my concern is that, they, that they'll use this incident as an impetus to uh, take away our freedoms. I, I, you know, that may be, I, but I don't really think that. Um, I don't really see that. I think that there's going to be a lot of inconveniences. You know, I think people that flies, you poor folks. Uh, I, th I think you poor folks that uh, flies is going to really be inconvenienced. But um, I don't. I don't really see. <laughs> I don't really think that it's going to be um, some kind of a tool that the, that the government's going to use to bring us into bond. I don't see that. It, to your right up front. Okay. Um, being that you get to travel a lot and see other parts of the country and uh, more of the flock than most of us do here. Yeah. How do you feel as but well, what do you feel that uh, the Church of Christ is prepared itself as a bride and are keeping watch? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what I see. Give me just a few more minutes here and I won't take long. We'll, 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 we'll change the order of the service here in just a minute. Let me say this for the benefit of those of you that needs to hear this. I personally would rather be home. I personally would rather be to stay home. Because I've been doing this six years and I'm tired. And it's a wear and tear on my body to put those kind of miles on my body. And my body's wore down now. And um, I personally would rather stay home. But whenever I go out, God gives me such good results. And there's such a hunger because we represent revival. And we represent a move of God. And so many pastors are desperate to get me to their church. And when I get there, it's not like you think it is in most cases. It's hard on me. When I get there, they're not in a state of revival. And in many, many cases, they're not, their worship is not revival worship. And even whenever it comes time to preaching, a lot of times, the preaching is very difficult because it's, it's rough plowing. But inevitably, God gives us a breakthrough. 
And by the time we leave, people are already calling back saying, when can you come back? God does something. He helps the churches and he helps the pastors. It's not something, and my body is really tired and I would really like to stay home, but I can't. I can't. I've got to continue to do what I do, and I hope Brownsville will let me do that. But I have to continue to do what I do because God's called me to do it for right now. And I need your prayers more than your criticisms. And um, it's, it's very difficult on me physically and it's very difficult on me spiritually because I give a lot and I pray for a lot of people. And I preach hard. I don't pull no punches. And um, the, church, the condition that I find so many churches in breaks my heart. And the pastors that bring me there bring me there because they're so desperate they want God to touch their people so bad and they want God to touch their church so bad and most of the time whenever I go God does give me favor and somehow they're touched and um, but I think that overall the church in America is really in a, in a real apathetic state and church pastors are so frustrated God has raised me up I don't understand it, but the Lord has raised me up and given me favor with pastors and pastors' wives. And I'm able to minister to them in a way that few people can minister. And um, I can help them, and I do help them. But I enjoy coming home here and being what I can be here at Brownsville also. And that's why I say I hope that Brownsville will continue to let me do this because it's a call. It's a very difficult call. It's hard. You don't know how much I'd rather be here and stay home because I'm extremely tired. I've got strep throat right now. I'm on penicillin the week before I had dizziness. And my body, I can tell my body's breaking down because I put a lot of miles on my body. But I still, I still must do what I've got to do because God's called me to do it. Pass it to your left in the rear. Um, earlier we were talking about the Arab nations, the Muslim nations, and how that door seems to be so closed to Christians. Yeah. And that quickened in me about the Holy Spirit ministering to people there. But um, are you in agreement that um, as a revived church and it's Brownsville, um, where our prayers can just penetrate forth if our country chooses to retaliate and send military men into these countries, that that in itself could be an opportunity. In the beginning of the sermon, you mentioned 1991, mm -hmm. and I was an intercessor at home. I was not a person that put on the news. I didn't even know anything that was going on in the world. I was vacuuming. And I started to go into um, travail, and I saw an opportunity of military men ministering in the Middle East. Yeah. And it quickened in me, and it's just been a burden all night that Brownsville could bless that enemy and stand in that gap for our government, which is doing that in a military sense, and we could yeah. be the spirit. You know, too, I think that there's a lot of people in some of those nations that they resent those terrorists. And they really wish somebody come in and flush them out. I really believe that. And God may raise up America and use us to flush them people out like that. And I think some of these nations would actually be relieved. And I believe that God can open up all kinds of fields, of mission fields for America. If we'll keep our spirit right. We don't need to do things out of hatred and revenge. We need to do it out of justice. Lyle, well, you're here. Girl, stand up. What's going on as an intercessor? Tell us. Bring the microphone to her right quick. Well, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us. And I believe that our prayers can change the future in, in some respects. Those things that are set in stone, as far as the Lord's concerned, He's going to have His way. But I think that we need to be very careful at, at this point 
not to judge an entire ethnic group by the actions of some. Mm -hmm. I think this is a danger, and uh, certainly for us as Christians, that should not be an issue. But we need to diligently pray that the world will have a, a mindset not to, re, to, to revenge ourselves on people just because they are of an ethnic uh, background. I believe that God is able to route out and do what he wants to do. But I've been saying for quite some years that God has given us an opportunity, a window of opportunity for repentance. And if we do not bow down, humble ourselves and repent, that uh, judgment is imminent because he would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he did not judge America for her sin. And so I, uh, I, I, I am fear and trembling. I believe that this is such a, a time that we need the mind of the Lord and wisdom, not only as a church, but in our leadership. These are some prayer issues, I believe, yes. that we really need to be looking at. Yeah. I think we need to stay away from the gloom and doom, mm -hmm. but I think we need to be realistic. Mm -hmm. And we also need to be encouraged that in this day and this hour, if we are close to the cross, we are close to Jesus, he's going to take care of us. Mm -hmm. No matter what the situation is, we, we need to get our eyes off of the situation. We need to get our eyes on the Lord. And this is something that the Lord has been giving to us all of these years as we've been in, in revival, is he's been instructing us, hear my voice. I've heard it time and again out of the preaching and, and so on. This is the time, he's been giving us time to learn his voice. He wants us now to hear his voice clearly. I think it can be as simple as, as uh, not getting on a plane if you don't feel like you're supposed to get on, for those of us that travel, <laughs> for those of us that fly. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think it can be as, as uh, we need to be as careful, you know, about going to the grocery store. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Right. He's been trying to teach us how to hear his voice and to walk in his way. Now, it's going to be a matter of us living it out. Yeah. And so I just want to make a declaration. Would it be all right? Sure. I Go declare, ahead. according to God's word, that what has occurred in this congregation... And for these last years, the flow of the Holy Spirit that has been in this building would begin to flow out all across the nations. Yes, Lord. That not only across the city of Pensacola, yes, but all over Florida, it would route out those things that are being done in darkness and in secret. Yes. And all the things being done in darkness and in secret will come to the light. And that God's judgment will begin to move in the area that he needs to move in. But that his light will begin to oh, shine so brightly that uh, the glory of Jesus will begin to be seen not only across our nation, but that there will be testimonies, tremendous testimonies of healing and deliverance and of the, of the salvation of Jesus Christ. And that the testimonies that will come out of this congregation and out of our nation will be literally begin to shake the nations of the world. Mm -hmm. And I declare, according to your word, O God, that light shall begin to spring forth where darkness has reigned. Well. Yes, and that our nation will turn back to the God of our salvation and the principles that our nation was established upon. And that Jesus will be lifted up and that worship the worship of him will be a sweet savor, not only from this place, but all across the world, that Jesus will be lifted up. Yes. Amen. Let's have, um, let's have some questions, just real quick, a couple of questions from somebody that's 60, 70, in their 60s or 70s. Somebody's in their 60s or 70s would like to ask a question quickly. Okay. Yes, sir. Right back there. Let's have one or two more of those, and then we'll pray. Pastor, I just want to say that yesterday was, was a catastrophe for sure. But uh, since uh, January the 1st, there's been roughly 750,000 babies killed in the womb. And we have a law in Congress to protect the, the terrorists. Yeah. 
And so uh, really yesterday was just a minor thing. And we have statesmen, we have people in Congress that want to claim to be statesmen, but they're, they're lesbianism, sodomites. And until America, until the church gets these people out of leadership, America is in trouble. Yeah. Well said, friend. Well said. One, one more in the 60s or 70s. Uh, okay, yes, sir. Jack? He's coming. Uh, yesterday, President Bush described the attack as an act of war. And today in Brussels, NATO invoked Article 5, mm -hmm. that an attack on one member of NATO is an attack on all. Right. So that any um, hunting down of the criminals would be a complete NATO response, not just the USA. Right. And also the, the European Union have suddenly realized how vulnerable they are to this type of thing. That's right. And they want to consolidate it um, effort by all Europe and America to be able to combat guer the guerrilla warfare which has been just broken out. So America at the moment is sort of really in shock and suffering a siege mentality but they're not alone because the world is really with them. Yeah. And it's just to give it this sort of some encouragement that really you have an awful lot of friends who want to help. Yeah, that's true. And you know, the interesting thing about that scripture that I read a while ago in Revelation concerning Babylon is that the Bible says that whenever Babylon went down, that the men, the people of the world saw from afar and they wept and wailed. And you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if it wasn't for America, the economies of the world wouldn't be like it is. And if it wasn't for places like New York and other cities in America, the world wouldn't have the delicacies that they have. So believe me, NATO and all the other foreign nations wants, wants us to do good and succeed and make a comeback. Yeah. Do we have any more 60s and 70s? One more? Okay. Yes, sir. Right there. Pastor, we've all been struck by the events of yesterday, and <clears throat> I think uh, one of the commentators pointed out that Pearl Harbor, uh, 24,000 men and women lost their lives on yeah. the attack, and probably this is going to be something even greater than that. My, uh, <clears throat> my, my question that I wanted to ask has to do with the scripture, Second Chronicles 7.14. And as these events start happening, in my mind, I see that the, the church is the key to the salvation of the world, really, in terms of if, if the people of God will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then God is going to hear from heaven. Right. He's going to forgive us. And he's going to heal our land. And a church, a church united throughout the world, strong and vibrant, is what the Lord is going to come back for. That's right. Not some weak, pamsy damsy mm -hmm. type of a, an organization. But uh, that shaking that's beginning to happen in the church is really going to cause people to turn, I think, uh, to, uh, to, second, to what Second, second Chronicles 7.14 is all about. Uh, would you would comment about that? Yeah, that's that's the key. The Lord said, "If my people, which you call on my name, will well, if they just humble themselves and pray." You know, one of the things that really struck me since yesterday, Pat Robertson called, been calling all day today, 
and they want to know if they could uh, tap into our service tonight and want to know what we was doing here at Brownsville tonight. They couldn't do it because we didn't have an uplink, but they wanted to tap into our services. Uh, they wanted to tap into church services across America and some of the largest churches and see what they were doing tonight. But one of the things that's really struck me is after all this hell broke loose, now the church is finally doing what we should have been doing all along. We're praying. You know, and church houses across America has become everything but a house of prayer. And, uh, you know, chicken fries, fish fries, and rummage sales, and teaching classes, and all that kind of stuff. And that's fine and good. But the Lord plainly says, My house shall be known as the house of prayer for all nations. And now something like this happens, and oh, hey, y'all come on Wednesday night, we're going to be praying. Well, we should have been doing this all along. So I feel like that, uh, you know, we're on the right road if we'll just stay there. Hallelujah. Let's take one more. Behind Harlan, you, Earl. There's Behind one, you, Earl. There's one right over here, too. Let's get two more, then. Right here. And right over there. Right over there, Earl. To your left. Pastor, to your left. Oh. Well, the Kilpatrick mind is going in so many directions, tangents, like, but I've, I've agreed basically with everything said tonight and certainly your responses. And yet my heart was really burning as I, their sister, I don't even know who she is over there, that she ministered and shared something. I've got a feeling that uh, revival is not over. I believe it's going to be short-lived. And I believe the Lord is coming. I believe he's preparing us. Our brother talked about 2 Chronicles 7:14. But I believe he's prepared to brought a people in for six years now, and he's purifying our hearts. Yeah. And I really think that, as our Sister Lila and different ones have alluded to, I mean, it's so easy to see the, 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 the negative and everything. And I totally, I was raised that way, believe me. I'm not even, and I'm not a positive, real positive person. So it takes a lot for me to say what I'm saying. It really, my wife would tell you that, okay? Because I was raised in the old school, if you yeah, know what right, I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I've got a feeling that this is not in vain. And that revival is, is picking up. It's been prophesied that the line would be here. And, and let's face it, most people and even nations don't come to God except through a tragedy. Right. It brings, it opens our eyes. Right. And I think it's a, definitely a window of opportunity. And I think as we pray, we need to just pray that God's will be done, His kingdom come, that He is not willing any perish, but that all come to repentance. At the next few months, for, I mean, look at it. For the last two, two and a half months, uh, I think revival, and I think Brownsville, I think Sunday morning prayer meetings on Thursday night. If you're not coming, you need a beer. They're awesome. Yeah. And Friday night revivals, yeah. Sunday morning re services are awesome. Yeah. God is encouraging us. He's given us his time of rest, perhaps. But I got a feeling everything's yeah. going to be all right. And in the end, we're going to see a mighty end gathering, quick gathering, right. and then the Lord's coming back. Amen. I believe that. You know, uh, Dr. Martin, stand up there just a minute. Dr. Martin, um, if I remember, if I remember correctly. If I remember correctly, Dr. Martin, uh, God usually breaks out in revival after um, wars and tragedies and things like that. Is, isn't that true? It is certainly the, often the case. Uh, we were talking today, the Azusa Street revival really caught fire after the San Francisco earthquake. When yeah. uh, the newspaper on the same day, the first story about Azusa Street came in the Los Angeles newspapers on the same day as the San Francisco earthquake that shook L.A., and that really brought the city to their knees in many ways, and not just the uh, Pentecostal revival, but churches all across Los Angeles were seeking God, and uh, often that is the case in history. Yeah. Okay, I think we have one more back here. Yes, sir. Uh, I was reading uh, Dr. Uh, Future Pickett's uh, yeah. book, yeah. Songs of Remem Remembrance. Yeah. And in that, in 1963, she had a prophecy from God, a vision, and she grew a... Uh, a power plant, a water power plant, yeah. and and that that plant was detailed, very detailed, and they took the engineers, and they couldn't believe that she did it yeah, I because that. of the technicality of it, mm -hmm. and and God was connecting all the churches, and and what future been, I mean, Doctor Pickett's been doing is going out just like you have, and and uh, uh, 
uh, ministering to the uh, different churches of the world and, and to, to, to release the revival, uh, the river of, 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 uh, of water, of God's revival fire throughout the whole world to go through that water system. Which, which connected all the church of the, of the United States, plus it goes under, yeah. under the oceans yeah. and it connects the world. Yeah. The, uh, and then God's going to open up that floodgate or the, the water and let it flow. But you know, I was reading Seth and I today, and it was talking about the. Uh, I want, I'd like to read two things in here, if I could. Two, two. Sure, go ahead. Zephaniah uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 14 through uh, 16. The, the, great of the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty man shall cry out. That, that day is a day of wrath, yeah. a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm, against the fortified cities and against the high towers. Yeah. My com comment there is, is that she was also saying in that book, you know, that a day could be, could be as, as long as a thousand years to the Lord, and that we enter into the third day where the revival fire is going to be coming, where the revival is going to open, God's going to open up that floodgate and let, let his revival fire waters go out to, to all the churches and, all the, and, and, and to the nations mm -hmm. of the world and to a call for repentance. Yeah. And then uh, Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1 through 3 is the call for repentance. It says, Gather yourself together, yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued or the day passes like shaft before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Mm -hmm. But this revival thing, where, you, where, you, where you, ever, all you, uh, people like you and other pastors around the United States have been going out and evangelizing and bringing the church together, is going to, I mean, I'm just believing the Lord is going to, you know, use this uh, as, 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 as in that, it, we're in that third day. Yes. And if other preachers can't fly, I can still go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lift up your hands with me, please, and let's just worship him for a few minutes. Come on. Come on, worship him. Lift up your voices. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We want to be ready, Lord, when you come. We want to be ready, Jesus. Purge our hearts, Lord. Wash us, Jesus. Wash us, Lord, until we're clean in your sight. Holy Lord. Hallelujah. Is Scott Brown here? Is Scott Brown here? Yeah. Scott Brown, there he is. Hey, buddy. God bless you, man. I go all I go all over this nation. I have people blowing show for us, but buddy, can't nobody blow it like you, man. You do good. We're going to uh, we're going to bring out the leaders of our country, banner boy. If we've ever needed to pray, we need to pray right now for the leaders of our country. When you see that banner come and he sounds that show for, I want you to let out a howl. Come on, go for it.
that the Lord didn't let one of those jets come through our building here. I'm so glad the Lord prevented that. I heard today on the news that they said that a man called from the jet that crashed in Virginia. He was on there with his two-month-old baby and said that he um, called his, his family and said that we're, we're hijacked. And they he found out that they were turning around and going back toward the D.C. area. And they said on the news today that this man took a vote of all the men. There wasn't 42 people on the plane, but he took a vote of all the men on the plane. And all the men of the plane unanimously agreed that they were going to overpower the hostages. And they think by overpowering those hostages, the plane crashed before it made it to its mark. And it was either on the way to the White House or to the Capitol or Camp David. And Lord, I thank you that you protected our nations. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Come on, thank the Lord. We thank you, Lord. We know. We thank you, Jesus. Get ready with the shofar, brother. I want to bring out my favorite banner. This is my favorite one. I can't help it. I'm sorry. I want to bring this out. And I want you to put it right up here by this one because that's just the way I believe it is going to be. Sound the show far, brother. Come on, let's pray for Israel. Jesus, Lord, we believe you to touch Israel. Protect Israel, Jesus. Lord, we need the protecting hand of Jehovah God. Lord, may we always stand by our ally, the Jews. We pray, Lord, for the blessings of God to be upon Jerusalem and all of Israel. No terrorist shall annihilate the holy people of God. Hallelujah. Move over just a little bit, guys, where I can see everybody. Move over this way, where I can see everybody. You move this way, son. Yeah. You remember... When President Clinton was in office, and, and here again I say this respectfully, I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm bad mouth the next President Clinton, but you remember he did his dead level best to get Yasser Arafat and Prime Minister Barack together, and he was willing to put Jerusalem on the bargaining table. 
even till his last day in office, he did his dead level best to get a piece of broker, to broker a peace agreement in the Middle East and was willing to forfeit Jerusalem from the Jews into the hands of Palestinians, and the Holy Ghost would not allow it. I said, the Holy Ghost would not allow it. He didn't then, and he won't now. And the Bible says, the Bible prophesied in the Old Testament, it said that the Jews would lose their city first and their land last, and when they came back into their land after the dispersion, the Bible said they'd get their land back first, which they did in 1948, and they'd get the city back last, which was 1967. And it's to remain in the control of the Jews. That's the way it's supposed to be. And no matter how hard the President of the United States tried and was willing to broker a peace deal, forfeiting Jerusalem from under the control of the Jews or either sharing power of Jerusalem with the Arabs, the Lord wouldn't allow it. Right until the day he went out of office. And I was glad I got to ask the president the question, what is your stance on Israel? And he said, when everybody else has turned coat and left them, I'll still be there with them. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's where we are. That's where we are in America. And that's exactly why what happened yesterday happened is because of this right here. Turn around, son. Turn this around here. It's because of this banner right here in Jerusalem. The Bible says in Zechariah 12 that God would make Jerusalem a cup of trembling for all nations. And what happened yesterday with that terrorist attack had to do with this right here, whether you believe that or not. And I want us to pray right now for the Jews and before anybody leaves, I want you to lift your voices with me in just a minute. Let's pray for them, but we're not through yet. I want to do one other thing. Let's pray for the Jews and let's pray for Israel. Come on, lift your voices. <laughs> Before we go, I had some other banners we were going to pray over, but before we go, I want to do one more thing. I want us to pray that through this tragedy in New York, that God somehow will give us an opportunity to minister to the Arab and the Muslim people. I believe that when we go in, and we are going to go in, when America goes in, and begins to scrape and scrape the terrorists out of these nations, I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit will open those nations up to the gospel of Jesus Christ. powerful name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 
Let me say to all of you tonight, thank you so much for coming, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to come in and talk to you. Down through the years I've done this, whenever we've had things happen that's you know been major, I've always liked to come together with our people here at Brownsville and just have a, sort of a family chat. And I appreciate you making the effort to come tonight, and I hope it's been a blessing to you, and may God bless you. We'll see you. Hallelujah.